section thirteen of germinal by emil zola translation by havelock ellis this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard part three chapter two it was monceau feast day the last sunday in july since saturday evening the good housekeepers of the settlement had deluged their parlors with water throwing bucketfuls over the flags and against the walls and the floor was not yet dry in spite of the white sand which had been strewn over it an expensive luxury for the purses of the poor but the day promised to be very warm it was one of those heavy skies threatening storm which in summer stifled this flat bare country of the nord sunday upset the hours for rising even among the mahus while the father after five o'clock grew weary of his bed and dressed himself the children lay in bed until nine on this day Mehu went to smoke a pipe in the garden and then came back to eat his bread and butter alone while waiting he thus passed the morning in a random manner he mended the tub which leaked stuck up beneath the clock a portrait of the prince imperial which had been given to the little ones however the others came down one by one father bonmort had taken a chair outside to sit in the sun while the mother and alzire had at once set about cooking catherine appeared pushing before her lenore and henri whom she had just dressed eleven o'clock struck and the odor of the rabbit which was boiling with potatoes was already filling the house when zacharie and jeanlin came down last still yawning and with their swollen eyes the settlement was now in a flutter excited by the feast day and in expectation of dinner which was being hastened for the departure in bands to monceau troops of children were rushing about men in their shirt-sleeves were trailing their old shoes with the lazy gait of days of rest windows and doors opened wide in the fine weather gave glimpses of rows of parlors which were filled with movement and shouts and the chatter of families and from one end to the other of the frontages there was a smell of rabbit a rich kitchen smell which on this day struggled with the inveterate odor of fried onion the Mahus dined at midday they made little noise in the midst of the chatter from door to door in the coming and going of women in a constant uproar of calls and replies of objects borrowed of youngsters hunted away or brought back with a slap besides they had not been on good terms during the last three weeks with their neighbors the lavaques on the subject of the marriage of zacharie and philomene the men passed the time of day but the women pretended not to know each other this quarrel had strengthened the relations with Perron. only Perron had left Perron and lydie with her mother and set out early in the morning to spend the day with a cousin at marchand's and they joked for they knew this cousin she had a moustache and was head captain at the Verreaux. Mehud declared that it was not proper to leave one's family on a feast day sunday beside the rabbit with potatoes a rabbit which had been fattening in the shed for a month the mehus had meat soup and beef the fortnight's wages had just fallen due the day before they could not recollect such a spread even at the last st barbara's day the fit of the miners when they do nothing for three days the rabbit had not been so fat nor so tender so the ten pairs of jaws from little estelle whose teeth were beginning to appear to old bonmart who was losing his worked so heartily that the bones themselves disappeared the meat was good but they could not digest it well they saw it too seldom everything disappeared there only remained a piece of boiled beef for the evening they could add bread and butter if they were hungry jeanlin went out first bebert was waiting for him behind the school and they prowled about for a long time before they were able to entice away lydie whom Brulet, who had decided not to go out was trying to keep with her when she perceived that the child had fled she shouted and brandished her lean arms while Perron, annoyed at the disturbance strolled quietly away with the air of a husband who can amuse himself with a good conscience 
knowing that his wife also has her little amusements old bonnemort set out at last and maheu decided to have a little fresh air after asking maheude if she would come and join him down below no she couldn't at all it was nothing but drudgery with the little ones but perhaps she would all the same she would think about it they could easily find each other when he got outside he hesitated then he went into the neighbor's to see if levaque was ready there he found zacharie who was waiting for philomene and the levaque woman started again on that everlasting subject of marriage saying that she was being made fun of and that she would have an explanation with maheude once and for all was life worth living when one had to keep one's daughter's fatherless children while she went off with her lover philomene quietly finished putting on her bonnet and zacharie took her off saying that he was quite willing if his mother was willing as levaque had already gone maheu referred his angry neighbor to his wife and hastened to depart but although, who was finishing a fragment of cheese with both elbows on the table obstinately refused the friendly offer of a glass he would stay in the house like a good husband gradually the settlement was emptied all the men went off one behind the other while the girls watching at the doors set out in the opposite direction on the arms of their lovers as her father turned the corner of the church catherine perceived chaval and hastening to join him they took together the monceau road and the mother remained alone in the midst of her scattered children without strength to leave her chair where she was pouring out a second glass of boiling coffee which she drank in little sips in the settlement there were only the women left inviting each other to finish the dregs of the coffee pots around tables that were still warm and greasy with the dinner maheu had guessed that levaque was at the advantage and he slowly went down to rasseneur's in fact behind the bar in the little garden shut in by a hedge levaque was having a game of skittles with some mates standing by and not playing father bonnemont and old mouque were following the ball so absorbed that they even forgot to nudge each other with their elbows a burning sun struck down on them perpendicularly there was only one streak of shade by the side of the inn and etienne was there drinking his glass before a table annoyed because souverine had just left him to go up to his room nearly every sunday the engine man shut himself up to write or to read will you have a game asked levaque of maheu but he refused it was too hot he was already dying of thirst Bresneur, called etienne bring a glass will you and turning towards maheu i'll stand it you know they now all treated each other familiarly Rasseneur did not hurry himself he had to be called three times and madame Rasseneur at last brought some lukewarm beer the young man had lowered his voice to complain about the house they were worthy people certainly people with good ideas but the beer was worthless and the soup abominable he would have changed his lodgings ten times over only the thought of the walk from the monceau held him back one day or another he would go and live with some family at the settlement sure enough said maheu in his slow voice sure enough you would be better in a family but shouts now broke out levaque had overthrown all the skittles at one stroke Mouk and bonnemort with their faces towards the ground in the midst of the tumult preserved a silence of profound approbation and the joy at the stroke found vent in jokes especially when the players perceived moquette's radiant face behind the hedge she had been prowling about there for an hour and at last ventured to come near on hearing the laughter what are you alone shouted levaque where are your sweethearts my sweethearts i've stabled them she replied with a fine impudent gaiety i'm looking for one they all offered themselves throwing coarse chaff at her she refused with a gesture and laughed louder playing the fine lady besides her father was watching the game without even taking his eyes from the fallen skittles ah levaque went on 
throwing a look towards etienne one can tell where you're casting sheep's eyes my girl you'll have to take him by force then etienne brightened up it was in fact around him that the putter was revolving and he refused amused indeed but without having the least desire for her she remained planted behind the hedge for some minutes longer looking at him with large fixed eyes then she slowly went away and her face suddenly became serious as if she were overcome by the powerful sun in a low voice etienne was again giving long explanations to Mehu regarding the necessity for the monsoon miners to establish a provident fund since the company professes to leave us free he repeated what is there to fear we only have their pensions and they distribute them according to their own idea since they don't hold back any of our pay well it will be prudent to form outside their good pleasure an association of mutual help on which we can count at least in cases of immediate need and he gave details and discussed the organization promising to undertake the labor of it i am willing enough said Mehu, at last convinced but there are the others get them to make up their minds levaque had won and they left the scales to empty their glasses but Mehu refused to drink a second glass he would see later on the day was not yet done he was thinking about Perron. where could he be no doubt at the l'enfant estaminé and having persuaded etienne and levaque the three set out for monceau at the same moment that a new band took possession of the skittles at the advantage on the road they had to pause at the casimir bar and then at the estimant du progrès comrades called them through the open doors and there was no way of refusing each time it was a glass too if they were polite enough to return the invitation they remained there ten minutes exchanging a few words and then began again a little farther on knowing the beer with which they could fill themselves without any other discomfort than having to piss it out again at the same measure as clear as rock water at the estaminet l'enfant they came right upon Perron, who was finishing his second glass and who in order not to refuse to touch glasses swallowed a third they naturally drank theirs also now there were four of them and they set out to see if zacharie was not at the estaminet tisson it was empty and they called for a glass in order to wait for him a moment then they thought of the estaminet saint eloi and accepted there a round from captain richon then they rambled from bar to bar without any pretext simply saying that they were having a stroll we must go to the volcan suddenly said the vac who was getting excited the others began to laugh and hesitated then they accompanied their comrade in the midst of the growing crowd in the long narrow room of the volcan on a platform raised at the end five singers the scum of the little prostitutes were walking about low-necked and with monstrous gestures and the customers gave ten sous when they desired to have one behind the stage there was especially a number of putters and landers even trammers of fourteen all the youth of the pit drinking more gin than beer a few old miners also ventured there and the worst husbands of the settlements those whose households were falling into ruin as soon as the band was seated round the little table etienne took possession of levaque to explain to him his idea of the provident fund like all new converts who have found a mission he had become an obstinate propagandist every member he repeated could easily pay in twenty sous a month as these twenty sous accumulated they would form a nice little sum in four or five years and when one has money one is ready eh for anything that turns up eh what do you say about it i've nothing to say against it replied levaque with an abstracted air we will talk about it he was excited by an enormous blonde and determined to remain behind when Mehu and Perron, after drinking their glasses, set out without waiting for a second song. Outside, Etienne, who had gone with them, found Moquette, who seemed to be following them. She was always there, looking at him with her large, fixed eyes, laughing her good-natured laugh, as if to say, Are you willing? 
the young man joked and shrugged his shoulders then with a gesture of anger she was lost in the crowd where then is chaval asked perron true said maheu he must surely be at piquette's let us go to piquette's but as they all three arrived at the estaminet piquette sounds of a quarrel arrested them at the door zacharie with his fist was threatening a thick-set phlegmatic walloon nail-maker while chaval with his hands in his pockets was looking on hello there's chaval said maheu quietly he is with catherine for five long hours the putter and her lover had been walking about the fair all along the montsou road that wide road with low bedaubed houses winding downhill a crowd of people wandered up and down in the sun like a trail of ants lost in a flat bare plain the eternal black mud had dried a black dust was rising and floating about like a storm cloud on both sides the public houses were crowded there were rows of tables to the street where stood a double rank of hucksters at stalls in the open air selling neck handkerchiefs and looking-glasses for the girls knives and caps for the lads to say nothing of sweetmeats sugar-plums and biscuits in front of the church archery was going on opposite the yards they were playing at bowls at the corner of the Oiselle road beside the administration buildings in a spot enclosed by fences crowds were watching a cock-fight two large red cocks armed with steel spurs their breasts torn and bleeding farther on at maigret's aprons and trousers were being won at billiards and there were long silences the crowd drank and stuffed itself without a sound a mute indigestion of beer and fried potatoes was expanding in the great heat still further increased by the frying-pan bubbling in the open air chaval bought a looking-glass for nineteen sous and a handkerchief for three francs to give to catherine at every turn they met mouque and bonnemort who had come to the fair and in meditative mood were plodding heavily through it side by side another meeting made them angry they caught sight of jeanlin inciting bebert and lady to steal bottles of gin from an extemporized bar installed at the edge of an open piece of ground catherine succeeded in boxing her brother's ears the little girl had already run away with a bottle these imps of satan would certainly end in a prison then as they arrived before another bar the tete coupe it occurred to chaval to take his sweetheart in to a competition of chaffinches which had been announced on the door for the past week fifteen nail-makers from the marchiennes nail-works had responded to the appeal each with a dozen cages and the gloomy little cages in which the blinded finches sat motionless were already hung upon a paling in the end yard it was a question as to which in the course of an hour should repeat the phrase of its song the greatest number of times each nail-maker with a slate stood near his cages to mark watching his neighbors and watched by them and the chaffinches had begun the chichoi with the deeper note the batisicoites with their shriller notes all at first timid and only risking a rare phrase then excited by each other's songs increasing the pace then at last carried away by such a rage of rivalry that they would even fall dead the nail-makers violently whipped them on with their voices shouting out to them in walloon to sing more still more yet a little more while the spectators about a hundred people stood by in mute fascination in the midst of this infernal music of a hundred and eighty chaffinches all repeating the same cadence out of time it was a batisicouic which gained the first prize a metal copy-pot catherine and chaval were there when zacharie and philomene entered they shook hands and all stayed together but suddenly zacharie became angry for he discovered that a nail-maker who had come in with his mates out of curiosity was pinching his sister's thigh she blushed and tried to make him be silent trembling at the idea that all these nail-makers would throw themselves on chaval and kill him if he objected to her being pinched she had felt the pinch but said nothing out of prudence her lover however 
merely made a grimace and as they all four now went out the affair seemed to be finished but hardly had they entered piquette's to drink a glass when the nail-maker reappeared making fun of them and coming close up to them with an air of provocation zacharie insulted in his good family feelings threw himself on the insolent intruder that's my sister you swine just wait a bit and i'm damned if i don't make you respect her the two men were separated while chaval who was quite calm only repeated let be it's my concern i tell you i don't care a damn for him maheu now arrived with his party and quieted catherine and philomene who were in tears the nail-maker had disappeared and there was laughter in the crowd to bring the episode to an end chaval who was at home at the estaminet piquette called for drinks etienne had touched glasses with catherine and all drank together the father the daughter and her lover the son and his mistress saying politely to your good health piron afterwards persisted in paying for more drinks and they were all in good humour when zacharie grew wild again at the sight of his comrade moquette and called him as he said to go and finish his affair with the nail-maker i shall have to go and do for him here chaval keep philomene with catherine i'm coming back maheu offered drinks in his turn after all if the lad wished to avenge his sister it was not a bad example but as soon as she had seen moquet philomene felt at rest and nodded her head sure enough the two chaps would be off to the balkan on the evenings of feast days the fair was terminated in the ballroom of the bon joyeux it was a widow madame Desir, who kept this ballroom a fat matron of fifty as round as a tub but so fresh that she still had six lovers one for every day of the week she said and the six together for sunday she called all the miners her children and grew tender at the thought of the flood of beer which she had poured out for them during the last thirty years and she boasted also that a putter never became pregnant without having first stretched her legs at her establishment there were two rooms in the bon joyeux the bar which contained the counter and tables then communicating with it on the same floor by a large arch was the ballroom a large hall only planked in the middle being paved with bricks round the sides it was decorated with two garlands of paper flowers which crossed one another and were united in the middle by a crown of the same flowers while along the walls were rows of gilt shields bearing the names of saints saint Ilo, patron of the iron workers saint crispin patron of the shoemakers saint barbara patron of the miners the whole calendar of corporations the ceiling was so low that the three musicians on their platform which was about the size of a pulpit knocked their heads against it when it became dark four petroleum lamps were fastened to the four corners of the room on this sunday there was dancing from five o'clock with the full daylight through the windows but it was not until towards seven that the rooms began to fill outside a gale was rising blowing great black showers of dust which blinded people and sleeted into the frying pans maheu etienne and perron having come in to sit down had found chaval at the bon joyeux dancing with catherine while philomene by herself was looking on neither levaque nor zacharie had reappeared as there were no benches around the ballroom catherine came after each dance to rest at her father's table they called philomene but she preferred to stand up the twilight was coming on the three musicians played furiously one could only see in the hall the movement of hips and breasts in the midst of a confusion of arms the appearance of the four lamps was greeted noisily and suddenly everything was lit up the red faces the dishevelled hair sticking to the skin the flying skirts spreading abroad the strong odour of perspiring couples maheu pointed out moquette to etienne she was as round and greasy as a bladder of lard revolving violently in the arms of a tall lean lander she had been obliged to to console herself and take a man at last at eight o'clock maheude appeared with estelle at her breast followed by alzire henri and lenore 
she had come there straight to her husband without fear of missing him they could sup later on as yet nobody was hungry with their stomachs soaked in coffee and thickened with beer other women came in and they whispered together when they saw behind Mehud the levaque woman enter with bouteloup who led in by the hand Achille and desiree philomene's little ones the two neighbors seemed to be getting on well together one turning round to chat with the other on the way there had been a great explanation and Mehud had resigned herself to zacharie's marriage in despair at the loss of her eldest son's wages but overcome by the thought that she could not hold it back any longer without injustice she was trying therefore to put a good face on it though with an anxious heart as a housekeeper who was asking herself how she could make both ends meet now that the best part of her purse was going place yourself there neighbor she said pointing to a table near that where maheu was drinking with etienne and pierron is not my husband with you asked the levaque woman the others told her that he would come soon they were all seated together in a heap but a loop and the youngsters so tightly squeezed among the drinkers that the two tables only formed one there was a call for drinks seeing her mother and her children philomene had decided to come near she accepted a chair and seemed pleased to hear that she was at last to be married then as they were looking for zacharie she replied in her soft voice i am waiting for him he is over there maheu had exchanged a look with his wife she had then consented he became serious and smoked in silence he also felt anxiety for the morrow in face of the ingratitude of these children who got married one by one leaving their parents in wretchedness the dancing still went on and the end of a quadrille drowned the ballroom in red dust the walls cracked a cornet produced shrill whistling sounds like a locomotive in distress and when the dancers stopped they were smoking like horses do you remember said the levaque woman bending towards maheude's ear you talked of strangling catherine if she did anything foolish chaval brought catherine back to the family table and both of them standing behind the father finished their glasses bah murmured maheude with an air of resignation one says things like that but what quiets me is that she will not have a child i feel sure of that you see if she is confined and obliged to marry what shall we do for a living then now the cornet was whistling a polka and as the deafening noise began again maheu in a low voice communicated an idea to his wife why should they not take a lodger etienne for example who was looking out for quarters they would have room since zacharie was going to leave them and the money that they would lose in that direction would be in part regained in the other maheu's face brightened certainly it was a good idea it must be arranged she seemed to be saved from starvation once more and her good humour returned so quickly that she ordered a new round of drinks etienne meanwhile was seeking to indoctrinate Perron, to whom he was explaining his plan of a provident fund he had made him promise to subscribe when he was imprudent enough to reveal his real aim and if we go out on strike you can see how useful that fund will be we can snap our fingers at the company we shall have there a fund to fight against them eh don't you think so Perron lowered his eyes and grew pale he stammered i think it over good conduct that's the best provident fund then maheu took possession of etienne and squarely like a good man proposed to take him as a lodger the young man accepted at once anxious to live in the settlement with the idea of being nearer to his mates the matter was settled in three words maheu declaring that they would wait for the marriage of the children just then zacharie at last came back with moquet and levaque the three brought in the odours of the volcan a breath of gin a musky acidity of ill-kept girls they were very tipsy and seemed well pleased with themselves digging their elbows into each other and grinning when he knew that he was at last to be married zacharie began to laugh so loudly that he choked philomene peacefully declared that she would rather see him laugh than cry as there were no more chairs bouteloup had moved so 
as to give up half of his to levaque and the latter suddenly much affected by realizing that the whole family party was there once more had beer served out by the lord we don't amuse ourselves so often he roared they remained there till ten o'clock women continued to arrive either to join or to take away their men bands of children followed in rows and the mothers no longer troubled themselves pulling out their long pale breasts like sacks of oats and smearing their chubby babies with milk while the little ones who were already able to walk gorged with beer and on all fours beneath the table relieved themselves without shame it was a rising sea of beer from madame de cire's disemboweled barrels the beer enlarged every belly flowing from noses eyes and everywhere so puffed out was the crowd that every one had a shoulder or knee poking into his neighbour all were cheerful and merry in thus feeling each other's elbows a continuous laugh kept their mouths open from ear to ear the heat was like an oven they were roasting and felt themselves at ease with glistening skin gilded in a thick smoke from the pipes the only discomfort was when one had to move away from time to time a girl rose went to the other end near the pump lifted her clothes and then came back beneath the garlands of painted paper the dancers could no longer see each other they perspired so much this encouraged the trammers to tumble the putters over catching them at random by the hips but where a girl tumbled with a man over her the cornet covered their fall with its furious music the swirl of feet wrapped them round as if the ball had collapsed upon them someone who was passing warned perron that his daughter lydie was sleeping at the door across the pavement she had drunk her share of the stolen bottle and was tipsy he had to carry her away in his arms while jeanlin and bebert who were more sober followed him behind thinking it a great joke this was the signal for departure and several families came out of the bon joyeux the Mehus and the levaques deciding to return to the settlement at the same moment father bonmort and old monk also left monceau walking in the same somnambulistic manner preserving the obstinate silence of their recollections and they all went back together passing for the last time through the fair where the frying pans were coagulating and by the estaminets from which the last glasses were flowing in a stream towards the middle of the road the storm was still threatening and sounds of laughter arose as they left the lighted houses to lose themselves in the dark country around panting breaths arose from the ripe wheat many children must have been made on that night they arrived in confusion at the settlement neither the levaques nor the mathews supped with appetite and the latter kept on dropping off to sleep while finishing their morning's boiled beef etienne had led away chaval for one more drink at rasseneur's i am with you said chaval when his mate had explained the matter of the provident fund put it there you're a fine fellow the beginning of drunkenness was flaming in etienne's eyes he exclaimed yes let's join hands as for me you know i would give up everything for the sake of justice both drink and girls there's only one thing that warms my heart and that is the thought that we are going to sweep away these bourgeois End of section thirteen. Section fourteen of Germinal by Emile Zola, translated by Havelock Ellis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Matt Perard. Part three, Chapter three. Towards the middle of August, Etienne settled with the Mahieus, Zachary having married and obtained from the company a vacant house in the settlement for Philomene and the two children during the first days the young man experienced some constraint in the presence of catherine there was a constant intimacy as he everywhere replaced the elder brother sharing jeanlin's bed over against the big sisters going to bed and getting up he had to dress and undress near her and see her take off and put on her garments when the last skirt fell from her she appeared of pallid whiteness that transparent snow of anemic blondes and he experienced a constant emotion in finding her 
with hands and face already spoilt as white as if dipped in milk from her heels to her neck where the line of tan stood out sharply like a necklace of amber he pretended to turn away but little by little he knew her the feet at first which his lowered eyes met then a glimpse of a knee when she slid beneath the coverlet then her bosom with little rigid breasts as she leant over the bowl in the morning she would hasten without looking at him and in ten seconds was undressed and stretched beside alzire with so supple and snake-like a movement that he had scarcely taken off his shoes when she disappeared turning her back and only showing her heavy knot of hair she never had any reason to be angry with him if a sort of obsession made him watch her in spite of himself at the moment when she lay down he avoided all practical jokes or dangerous pastimes the parents were there and besides he still had for her a feeling half of friendship and half of spite which prevented him from treating her as a girl to be desired in the midst of the abandonment of their now common life in dressing at meals during work where nothing of them remained secret not even their most intimate needs all the modesty of the family had taken refuge in the daily bath for which the young girl now went upstairs alone while the men bathed below one after the other at the end of the first month etienne and catherine seemed no longer to see each other when in the evening before extinguishing the candle they moved about the room undressed she had ceased to hasten and resumed her old custom of doing up her hair at the edge of her bed while her arms raised in the air lifted her chemise to her thighs and he without his trousers sometimes helped her looking for the hairpins that she had lost custom killed the shame of being naked they found it natural to be like this for they were doing no harm and it was not their fault if there was only one room for so many people sometimes however a trouble came over them suddenly at moments when they had no guilty thought after some nights when he had not seen her pale body he suddenly saw her white all over with a whiteness which shook him with a shiver which obliged him to turn away for fear of yielding to the desire to take her on other evenings without any apparent reason she would be overcome by a panic of modesty and hastened to slip between the sheets as if she felt the hands of this lad seizing her then when the candle was out they both knew that they were not sleeping but were thinking of each other in spite of their weariness this made them restless and sulky all the following day they liked best the tranquil evenings when they could behave together like comrades etienne only complained of jeanlin who slept curled up alzire slept lightly and lenore and henri were found in the morning in each other's arms exactly as they had gone to sleep in the dark house there was no other sound than the snoring of maheu and Mehid, rolling out at regular intervals like a forge bellows on the whole etienne was better off than at rasseneur's the bed was tolerable and the sheets were changed every month he had better soup too and only suffered from the rarity of meat but they were all in the same condition and for forty-five francs he could not demand rabbit to every meal these forty-five francs helped the family and enabled them to make both ends meet though always leaving some small debts and arrears so the mehus were grateful to their lodger his linen was washed and mended his buttons sewn on and his affairs kept in order in fact he felt all around him a woman's neatness and care it was at this time that etienne began to understand the ideas that were buzzing in his brain up till then he had only felt an instinctive revolt in the midst of the inarticulate fermentation among his mates all sorts of confused questions came before him why are some miserable why are others rich why are the former beneath the heel of the latter without hope of ever taking their place and his first stage was to understand his ignorance a secret shame a hidden annoyance gnawed him from that time he knew nothing he dared not talk about these things which were working in him like a passion 
the equality of all men and the equity which demanded a fair division of the earth's wealth he thus took to the methodless study of those who in ignorance feel the fascination of knowledge he now kept up a regular correspondence with Bouchard, who was better educated than himself and more advanced in the socialist movement he had books sent to him and his ill-digested reading still further excited his brain especially a medical book entitled hygiene du minor in which a belgian doctor had summed up the evils of which the people in coal mines were dying without counting treatises on political economy incomprehensible in their technical dryness anarchist pamphlets which upset his ideas and old numbers of newspapers which he preserved as irrefutable arguments for possible discussions souverain also lent him books and the works on cooperative societies had made him dream for a month of a universal exchange association abolishing money and basing the whole social life on work the shame of his ignorance left him and a certain pride came to him now that he felt himself thinking during these first months etienne retained the ecstasy of a novice his heart was bursting with generous indignation against the oppressors and looking forward to the approaching triumph of the oppressed he had not yet manufactured a system his reading had been too vague rasseneur's practical demands were mixed up in his mind with souverain's violent and destructive methods and when he came out of the advantage where he was to be found nearly every day railing with them against the company he walked as if in a dream assisting at a radical regeneration of nations to be effected without one broken window or a single drop of blood the methods of execution remained obscure he preferred to think that things would go very well for he lost his head as soon as he tried to formulate a programme of reconstruction he even showed himself full of illogical moderation he often said that we must banish politics from the social question a phrase which he had read and which seemed a useful one to repeat among the phlegmatic colliers with whom he lived every evening now at the Mehus, they delayed half an hour before going to bed etienne always introduced the same subject as his nature became more refined he found himself wounded by the promiscuity of the settlement were they beasts to be thus pinned together in the midst of the fields so tightly packed that one could not change one's shirt without exhibiting one's backside to the neighbours and how bad it was for health and boys and girls were forced to grow corrupt together lord replied Mehu, if there were more money there would be more comfort all the same it's true enough that it's good for no one to live piled up like that it always ends with making the men drunk and the girls big-bellied and the family began to talk each having his say while the petroleum lamp vitiated the air of the room already stinking of fried onion no life was certainly not a joke one had to work like a brute of labour which was once a punishment for convicts one left one's skin there oftener than was one's turn all that without even getting meat on the table in the evening no doubt one had one's feed one ate indeed but so little just enough to suffer without dying overcome with debts and pursued as if one had stolen the bread when sunday came one slept from weariness the only pleasures were to get drunk and to get a child with one's wife then the beer swelled the belly and the child later on left you to go to the dogs no it was certainly not a joke then maheu joined in the bother is you see when you have to say to yourself that it won't change when you're young you think that happiness will come some time you hope for things and then the wretchedness begins always over again and you get shut up in it now i don't wish harm to any one but there are times when this injustice makes me mad there was silence they were all breathing with the vague discomfort of this closed-in horizon father bonmort only if he was there opened his eyes with surprise for in his time people used not to worry about things 
they were born in the coal and they hammered at the seam without asking for more while now there was an air of stirring which made the colliers ambitious it don't do to spit at anything he murmured a good glass is a good glass as to the masters they're often rascals but there always will be masters won't there what's the use of racking your brains over those things etienne at once became animated what the worker was to be forbidden to think why that was just it things would change now because the worker had begun to think in the old man's time the miner lived in the mine like a brute like a machine for extracting coal always under the earth with ears and eyes stopped to outward events so the rich who governed found it easy to sell him and buy him and to devour his flesh he did not even know what was going on but now the miner was waking up down there germinating in the earth just as a grain germinate and some fine day he would spring up in the midst of the fields yes men would spring up an army of men who would re-establish justice is it not true that all citizens are equal since the revolution because they vote together why should the worker remain the slave of the master who pays him the big companies with their machines were crushing everything and one no longer had against them the ancient guarantees when people of the same trade united in a body were able to defend themselves it was for that by god and for no other reason that all would burst up one day thanks to education one had only to look into the settlement itself the grandfathers could not sign their names the fathers could do so and as for the sons they read and wrote like schoolmasters ah it was springing up it was springing up little by little a rough harvest of men who would ripen in the sun from the moment when they were no longer each of them stuck to his place for his whole existence and when they had the ambition to take a neighbor's place why should they not hit out with their fists and try for the mastery maheu was shaken but remained full of doubts as soon as you move they give you back your certificate he said the old man is right it will always be the miner who gets all the trouble without a chance of a leg of mutton now and then as a reward maheu who had been silent for a while awoke as from a dream but if what the priests tell is true if the poor people in this world become the rich ones in the next a burst of laughter interrupted her even the children shrugged their shoulders being incredulous in the open air keeping a secret fear of ghosts in the pit but glad of the empty sky ah bosh the priests exclaimed maheu if they believed that they'd eat less and work more so as to reserve a better place for themselves up there no when one's dead one's dead maheu sighed deeply oh lord lord then her hands fell on to her knees with a gesture of immense dejection then if that's true we are done for we are they all looked at one another father bonnemort spat into his handkerchief while maheu sat with his extinguished pipe which he had forgotten in his mouth alzire listened between lenore and henri who were sleeping on the edge of the table but catherine with her chin in her hand never took her large clear eyes off etienne while he was protesting declaring his faith and opening out the enchanting future of his social dream around them the settlement was asleep one only heard the stray cries of a child or the complaints of a belated drunkard in the parlor the clocks ticked slowly and a damp freshness arose from the sanded floor in spite of the stuffy air fine ideas said the young man why do you need a good god in his paradise to make you happy haven't you got it in your own power to make yourselves happy on earth with his enthusiastic voice he spoke on and on the closed horizon was bursting out a gap of light was opening in the sombre lives of these poor people the eternal wretchedness beginning over and over again the brutalizing labor the fate of a beast who gives his wool and has his throat cut all the misfortune disappeared as though swept away by a great flood of sunlight 
and beneath the dazzling gleam of fairyland justice descended from heaven since the good god was dead justice would assure the happiness of men and equality and brotherhood would reign a new society would spring up in a day just as in dreams an immense town with the splendor of a mirage in which each citizen lived by his work and took his share in the common joys the old rotten world had fallen to dust a young humanity purged from its crimes formed but a single nation of workers having for their motto to each according to his deserts and to each desert according to its performance and this stream grew continually larger and more beautiful and more seductive as it mounted higher in the impossible at first maheu refused to listen possessed by a deep dread no no it was too beautiful it would not do to embark upon these ideas for they made life seem abominable afterwards and one would have destroyed everything in the effort to be happy when she saw maheu's eyes shine and that he was troubled and won over she became restless and exclaimed interrupting etienne don't listen my man you can see he's only telling us fairy tales do you think the bourgeois would ever consent to work as we do but little by little the charm worked on her also her imagination was aroused and she smiled at last entering his marvellous world of hope it was so sweet to forget for a while the sad reality when one lives like the beast with face bent towards the earth one needs a corner of falsehood where one can amuse oneself by regaling on the things one will never possess and what made her enthusiastic and brought her into agreement with the young man was the idea of justice now there you're right she exclaimed when a thing's just i don't mind being cut to pieces for it and it's true enough it would be just for us to have a turn then maheu ventured to become excited blast it all i am not rich but i would give five francs to keep alive to see that what a hustling eh will it be soon and how can we set about it etienne began talking again the old social system was cracking it could not last more than a few months he affirmed roundly as to the methods of execution he spoke more vaguely mixing up his reading and fearing before ignorant hearers to enter on explanations where he might lose himself all the systems had their share in it softened by the certainty of easy triumph a universal kiss which would bring to an end all class misunderstandings without taking count however of the thick heads among the masters and bourgeois whom it would perhaps be necessary to bring to reason by force and the maheus looked as if they understood approving and accepting miraculous solutions with the blind faith of new believers like those christians of the early days of the church who awaited the coming of a perfect society on the dunghill of the ancient world little azira picked up a few words and imagined happiness under the form of a very warm house where children could play and eat as long as they liked catherine without moving her chin always resting in her hand kept her eyes fixed on etienne and when he stopped a slight shudder passed over her and she was quite pale as if she felt the cold but maheu looked at the clock past nine can it be possible we shall never get up to-morrow and the maheus left the table with hearts ill at ease and in despair it seemed to them that they had just been rich and that they had now suddenly fallen back into the mud father von mort who was setting out for the pit growled that those sort of stories wouldn't make the soup better while the others went upstairs in single file noticing the dampness of the walls and the pestiferous stuffiness of the air upstairs amid the heavy slumber of the settlement when catherine had got into bed last and blown out the candle at the end heard her tossing feverishly before getting to sleep often at these conversations the neighbors came in levaque who grew excited at the idea of a general sharing Perron, who prudently went to bed as soon as they attacked the company at long intervals zacharie came in for a moment 
but politics bored him he preferred to go off and drink a glass at the advantage as to cheval he would go to extremes and wanted to draw blood nearly every evening he passed an hour with the Mahieus. in this assiduity there was a certain unconfessed jealousy the fear that he would be robbed of catherine this girl of whom he was already growing tired had become precious to him now that a man slept near her and could take her at night etienne's influence increased he gradually revolutionized the settlement his propaganda was unseen and all the more sure since he was growing in the estimation of all Mahid, notwithstanding the caution of a prudent housekeeper treated him with consideration as a young man who paid regularly and neither drank nor gambled with his nose always in a book she spread abroad his reputation among the neighbors as an educated lad a reputation which they abused by asking him to write their letters he was a sort of business man charged with correspondence and consulted by households in affairs of difficulty since september he had thus at last been able to establish his famous provident fund which was still very precarious only including the inhabitants of the settlement but he hoped to be able to obtain the adhesion of the miners at all the pits especially if the company which had remained passive continued not to interfere he had been made secretary of the association and he even received a small salary for the clerking this made him almost rich if a married miner can with difficulty make both ends meet a sober lad who had no burdens can even manage to save from this time a slow transformation took place in etienne certain instincts of refinement and comfort which had slept during his poverty were now revealed he began to buy cloth garments he also bought a pair of elegant boots he became a big man the whole settlement grouped round him the satisfaction of his self-love was delicious he became intoxicated with this first enjoyment of popularity to be at the head of others to command he who was so young and but the day before had been a mere labourer this filled him with pride and enlarged his dream of an approaching revolution in which he was to play a part his face changed he became serious and put on airs while his growing ambition inflamed his theories and pushed him to ideas of violence but autumn was advancing and the october cold had blighted the little gardens of the settlement behind the thin lilacs the trammers no longer tumbled the putters over on the shed and only the winter vegetables remained the cabbages pearled with white frost the leeks and the salads once more the rains were beating down on the red tiles and flowing down into the tubs beneath the gutters with the sound of a torrent in every house the stove piled up with coal was never cold and poisoned the close parlours it was the season of wretchedness beginning once more in october on one of the first frosty nights etienne feverish after his conversation below could not sleep he had seen catherine glide beneath the coverlet and then blow out the candle she also appeared to be quite overcome and tormented by one of those fits of modesty which still made her hasten sometimes and so awkwardly that she only uncovered herself more in the darkness she lay as though dead but he knew that she also was awake and he felt that she was thinking of him just as he was thinking of her this mute exchange of their beings had never before filled them with such trouble the minutes went by and neither he nor she moved only their breathing was embarrassed in spite of their efforts to, re to retain it twice over he was on the point of rising and taking her it was idiotic to have such a strong desire for each other and never to satisfy it why should they thus sulk against what they desired the children were asleep she was quite willing he was certain that she was waiting for him stifling and that she would close her arms round him in silence with clenched teeth nearly an hour passed he did not go to take her and she did not turn round for fear of calling him the more they lived side by side the more a barrier was raised of shames repugnancies delicacies of friendship 
which they could not explain even to themselves end of section fourteen section fifteen of germanon by emile zola translated by havelock ellis this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perrard part three chapter four listen said maheu to her man when you go to montsou for the pay just bring me back a pound of coffee and a kilo of sugar he was selling one of his shoes in order to spare the cobbling good he murmured without leaving his task i should like you to go to the butcher's too a bit of veal eh it's so long since we saw it this time he raised his head do you think then that i've got thousands coming in the fortnight's pay is too little as it is with their confounded idea of always stopping work they were both silent it was after breakfast one saturday at the end of october the company under the pretext of the derangement caused by payment had on this day once more suspended output in all their pits seized by panic at the growing industrial crisis and not wishing to augment their already considerable stock they profited by the smallest pretext to force their ten thousand workers to rest you know that etienne is waiting for you at rasseneur's began Mehid again take him with you you'll be more clever than you are in clearing up matters if they haven't counted all your hours Mehud nodded approval and just talk to those gentlemen about your father's affair the doctor's on good terms with the directors it's true isn't it old un that the doctor's mistaken and that you can still work for ten days father von Mort, with the numbed pause as he said had remained nailed to his chair she had to repeat her question and he growled sure enough i can work one isn't done for because one's legs are bad all that is just stories they make up so as not to give the hundred and eighty franc pension Mahid thought of the old man's forty sous which he would perhaps never bring in any more and she uttered a cry of anguish my god we shall soon be all dead if this goes on when one is dead said maheu one doesn't get hungry he put some nails into his shoes and decided to set out the du saint settlement would not be paid till towards four o'clock the men did not hurry therefore but waited about going off one by one beset by the women who implored them to come back at once many gave them commissions to prevent them forgetting themselves in public houses at rossignol etienne had received news disquieting rumours were flying about it was said that the company was more and more discontented over the timbering they were overwhelming the workmen with fines and a conflict appeared inevitable that was however only the avowed dispute beneath it were grave and secret causes of complication just as etienne arrived a comrade who was drinking a glass on his return from Monceau, was telling that an announcement had been stuck up at the cashier's but he did not quite know what was on the announcement a second entered then a third and each brought a different story it seemed certain however that the company had taken a resolution what do you say about it eh asked etienne sitting down near Sauron at a table where nothing was to be seen but a packet of tobacco the engine man did not hurry but finished rolling a cigarette i say that it was easy to foresee they want to push you to extremes he alone had a sufficiently keen intelligence to analyze the situation he explained it in his quiet way the company suffering from the crisis had been forced to reduce their expenses if they were not to succumb and it was naturally the workers who would have to tighten their bellies under some pretext or another the company would nibble at their wages for two months the coal had been remaining at the surface of their pits and nearly all the workshops were resting as the company did not dare to rest in this way terrified at the ruinous inaction they were meditating a middle course perhaps a strike from which the miners would come out crushed and worse paid then the new provident fund was disturbing them 
as it was a threat for the future while a strike would relieve them of it by exhausting it when it was still small rasseneur had seated himself beside etienne and both of them were listening in consternation they could talk aloud because there was no one there but madame rasseneur seated at the counter what an idea murmured the innkeeper what's the good of it the company has no interest in a strike nor the men either it would be best to come to an understanding this was very sensible he was always on the side of reasonable demands since the rapid popularity of his old lodger he had even exaggerated the system of possible progress saying they would obtain nothing if they wished to have everything at once in his fat good-humoured nature nourished on beer a secret jealousy was forming increased by the desertion of his bar into which the workmen from the bureau now came more rarely to drink and to listen and he thus sometimes even began to defend the company forgetting the rancour of an old miner who had been turned off then you are against the strike cried madame rasseneur without leaving the counter and as he energetically replied yes she made him hold his tongue bah you have no courage let these gentlemen speak etienne was meditating with his eyes fixed on the glass which she had served to him at last he raised his head i dare say it's all true what our mate tells us and we must get resigned to the strike if they force it on us Clouchard has just written me some very sensible things on this matter he's against the strike too for the men would suffer as much as the masters and it wouldn't come to anything decisive only it seems to him a capital chance to get our men to make up their minds to go into his big machine here's his letter in fact Clouchard, in despair at the suspicion which the international aroused among the miners at monceau was hoping to see them enter in a mass if they were forced to fight against the company in spite of his efforts etienne had not been able to place a single member's card and he had given his best efforts to his provident fund which was much better received but this fund was still so small that it would be quickly exhausted as souverain said and the strikers would then inevitably throw themselves into the working men's association so that their brothers in every country could come to their aid how much have you in the fund asked rasseneur hardly three thousand francs replied etienne and you know that the directors sent for me yesterday oh they were very polite they repeated that they wouldn't prevent their men from forming a reserve fund but i quite understood that they wanted to control it we are bound to have a struggle over that the innkeeper was walking up and down whistling contemptuously three thousand francs what can you do with that it wouldn't yield six days bread and if we counted on foreigners such as the people in england one might go to bed at once and turn up one's toes no it was too foolish this strike then for the first time bitter words passed between these two men who usually agreed together at last in their common hatred of capital we shall see and you what do you say about it repeated etienne turning towards souverain the latter replied with his usual phrase of habitual contempt a strike foolery then in the midst of the angry silence he added gently on the whole i shouldn't say no if it amuses you it ruins the one side and kills the other and that is always so much cleared away only in that way it will take quite a thousand years to renew the world just begin by blowing up this prison in which you are all being done to death with his delicate hand he pointed out the bureau the buildings of which could be seen through the open door but an unforeseen drama interrupted him poland the big tame rabbit which had ventured outside came bounding back fleeing from the stones of a band of trammers and in her terror with fallen ears and raised tail she took refuge against his legs scratching and imploring him to take her up when he had placed her on his knees he sheltered her with both hands and fell into that kind of dreamy somnolence into which the caress of this soft warm fur always plunged him almost at the same time maheu came in 
he would drink nothing in spite of the polite insistence of madame rasseneur who sold her beer as though she made a present of it etienne had risen and both of them set out for montsou on payday at the company's yards montsou seemed to be in the midst of a fete as on fine sunday feast days bands of miners arrived from all the settlements the cashier's office being very small they preferred to wait at the door stationed in groups on the pavement barring the way in a crowd that was constantly renewed hucksters profited by the occasion and installed themselves with their movable stalls that sold even pottery and cooked meats but it was especially the estaminets and the bars which did a good trade for the miners before being paid went to the counters to get patients and returned to them to wet their pay as soon as they had it in their pockets but they were very sensible except when they finished it at the volcan as maheu and etienne advanced among the groups they felt that on that day a deep exasperation was rising up it was not the ordinary indifference with which the money was taken and spent at the publics fists were clenched and violent words were passing from mouth to mouth is it true then asked maheu of chaval whom he met before the estaminet piquet that they've played the dirty trick but chaval contented himself by replying with a furious growl throwing a sidelong look on etienne since the working had been renewed he had hired himself on with others more and more bitten by envy against this comrade the newcomer who posed as a boss and whose boots as he said were licked by the whole settlement this was complicated by a lover's jealousy he never took catherine to requillard now or behind the pit-bank without accusing her in abominable language of sleeping with her mother's lodger then seized by a savage desire he would stifle her with caresses maheu asked him another question is it the voreau's turn now and when he turned his back after nodding affirmatively both men decided to enter the yards the counting-house was a small rectangular room divided in two by a grating on the forms along the wall five or six miners were waiting while the cashier assisted by a clerk was paying another who stood before the wicket with his cap in his hand above the form on the left a yellow placard was stuck up quite fresh against the smoky grey of the plaster and it was in front of this that the men had been constantly passing all the morning they entered two or three at a time stood in front of it and then went away without a word shrugging their shoulders as if their backs were crushed two colliers were just then standing in front of the announcement a young one with a square brutish head and a very thin one his face dull with age neither of them could read the young one spelt moving his lips the old one contented himself with gazing stupidly many came in thus to look without understanding read us up there said maheu who was not very strong either in reading to his companion then etienne began to read him the announcement it was a notice from the company to the miners of all the pits informing them that in consequence of the lack of care bestowed on the timbering and being weary of inflicting useless fines the company had resolved to apply a new method of payment for the extraction of coal henceforward they would pay for the timbering separately by the cubic meter of wood taken down and used based on the quantity necessary for good work the price of the tub of coal extracted would naturally be lowered in the proportion of fifty centimes to forty according to the nature and distance of the cuttings and a somewhat obscure calculation endeavoured to show that this diminution of ten centimes would be exactly compensated by the price of the timbering the company added also that wishing to leave every one time to convince himself of the advantages presented by this new scheme they did not propose to apply it till monday the first of december don't read so loud over there shouted the cashier we can't hear what we are saying etienne finished reading without paying attention to this observation his voice trembled and when he had reached the end they all continued to gaze steadily at the placard the old miner and the young one looked as though they expected something more then they went away with depressed shoulders good god 
muttered maheu he and his companions sat down absorbed with lowered heads and while files of men continued to pass before the yellow paper they made calculations were they being made fun of they could never make up with the timbering for the ten centimes taken off the tram at most they could only get to eight centimes so the company would be robbing them of two centimes without counting the time taken by careful work this then was what this disguised lowering of wages really came to the company was economizing out of the miners pockets good lord good lord repeated maheu raising his head we should be bloody fools if we took that but the wicket being free he went up to be paid the heads only of the workings presented themselves at the desk and then divided the money between their men to save time maheu and associates said the clerk Boulogne seemed cutting number seven he searched through the lists which were prepared from the inspection of the tickets on which the captain stated every day for each stall the number of trams extracted then he repeated maheu and associates Boulogne seemed cutting number seven one hundred and thirty-five francs the cashier paid beg pardon sir stammered the pikeman in surprise are you sure you have not made a mistake he looked at the small sum of money without picking it up frozen by a shudder which went to his heart it was true he was expecting bad payment but it could not come to so little or he must have calculated wrong when he had given their shares to zacharie etienne and the other maid who replaced chaval there would remain at most fifty francs for himself his father catherine and jeanlin no no i've made no mistake replied the clerk there are two sundays and four rest days to be taken off that makes nine days of work maheu followed this calculation in a low voice nine days gave him about thirty francs eighteen to catherine nine to jeanlin as to father bonnemort he only had three days no matter by adding the ninety francs of zacharie and the two mates that would surely make more and don't forget the fines added the clerk twenty francs for fines for defective timbering the pikeman made a gesture of despair twenty francs of fines four days of rest that made out the account to think that he had once brought back a fortnight's pay of full a hundred and fifty francs when father bonnemort was working and zacharie had not yet set up house for himself well are you going to take it cried the cashier impatiently you can see there's someone else waiting if you don't want it say so as maheu decided to pick up the money with his large trembling hand the clerk stopped him wait i have your name here to saint maheu is it not the general secretary wishes to speak to you go in he is alone the dazed workman found himself in a, an office furnished with old mahogany upholstered with faded green rep as he listened for five minutes to the general secretary a tall sallow gentleman who spoke to him over the papers of his bureau without rising but the buzzing in his ears prevented him from hearing he understood vaguely that the question of his father's retirement would be taken into consideration with a pension of a hundred and fifty francs fifty years of age and forty years of service then it seemed to him that the secretary's voice became harder there was a reprimand he was accused of occupying himself with politics an allusion was made to his lodger and the provident fund finally he was advised not to compromise himself with these follies he who was one of the best workmen in the mine he wished to protest but could only pronounce words at random twisting his cap between his feverish fingers and he retired stuttering certainly sir i can assure you sir outside when he had found etienne who was waiting for him he broke out well i am a bloody fool i ought to have replied not enough money to get bread and insults as well yes he has been talking against you he told me the settlement was being poisoned and what's to be done good god bend one's back and say thank you he's right that's the wisest plan maheu fell silent overcome at once by rage and fear etienne was gloomily thinking once more they traversed the groups who blocked the road 
the exasperation was growing the exasperation of a calm race the muttered warning of a storm without violent gestures terrible to see above this solid mass a few men understanding accounts had made calculations and the two centimes gained by the company over the wood were rumoured about and excited the hardest heads but it was especially the rage over this disastrous pay the rebellion of a hunger against the rest days and the fines already there was not enough to eat and what would happen if wages were still further lowered in the estaminets the anger grew loud and fury so dried their throats that the little money taken went over the counters from Monceau to the settlement etienne and maheu never exchanged a word when the latter entered maheu who was alone with the children noticed immediately that his hands were empty well you're a nice one she said where's my coffee and my sugar and the meat a bit of veal wouldn't have ruined you he made no reply stifled by the emotion he had been keeping back then the coarse face of this man hardened to work in the mines became swollen with despair and large tears broke from his eyes and fell in a warm rain he had thrown himself into a chair weeping like a child and throwing fifty francs on the table here he stammered that's what i've brought you back that's our work for all of us Mehid looked at etienne and saw that he was silent and overwhelmed then she also wept how were nine people to live for a fortnight on fifty francs her eldest son had left them the old man could no longer move his legs it would soon mean death alzire threw herself round her mother's neck overcome on hearing her weep estelle was howling lenore and henri were sobbing and from the entire settlement there soon arose the same cry of wretchedness the men had come back and each household was lamenting the disaster of this bad pay the doors opened women appeared crying aloud outside as if their complaints could not be held beneath the ceilings of these small houses a fine rain was falling but they did not feel it they called one another from the pavements they showed one another in the hollow of their hands the money they had received look they've given him this do they want to make fools of people as for me see i haven't got enough to pay for the fortnight's bread with and just count mine i should have to sell my shifts Mehud had come out like the others a group had formed around the Levaque woman who was shouting loudest of all for her drunkard of a husband had not even turned up and she knew that large or small the pay would melt away at the volcan philomene watched maheu so that zacharie should not get hold of the money pierron was the only one who seemed fairly calm for that sneak of a pierron always arranged things no one knew how so as to have more hours on the captain's ticket than his mates but mother brule thought this cowardly of her son-in-law she was among the enraged lean and erect in the midst of the group with her fists stretched towards monceau too thick she cried without naming the hambos that this morning i saw their servant go by in a carriage yes the cook in a carriage with two horses going to marchiennes to get fish sure enough a clamour arose and the and the abuse began again that servant in a white apron taken to the market of the neighbouring town in her master's carriage aroused indignation while the workers were dying of hunger they must have their fish at all costs perhaps they would not always be able to eat their fish the turn of the poor people would come and the ideas sown by etienne sprang up and expanded in this cry of revolt it was impatience before the promised age of gold a haste to get a share of the happiness beyond this horizon of misery closed in like the grave the injustice was becoming too great at last they would demand their rights since the bread was being taken out of their mouths the women especially would have liked at once to take by assault this ideal city of progress in which there was to be no more wretchedness it was almost night and the rain increased while they were still filling the settlement with their tears in the midst of the screaming helter-skelter of the children that evening at the advantage the strike was decided on rasseneur 
no longer struggled against it and souverain accepted it as a first step etienne summed up the situation in a word if the company really wanted a strike then the company should have a strike End of section 15. Section 16 of Germinal by Emile Zola. Translation by Havelock Ellis. The Slipperbox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Gerard. Part 3. Chapter 5. A week passed and work went on suspiciously and mournfully in expectation of the conflict. Among the Mayhews, the fortnight threatened to be more meager than ever mehud grew bitter in spite of her moderation and good sense her daughter catherine too had taken it into her head to stay out one night on the following morning she came back so weary and ill after this adventure that she was not able to go to the pit and she told with tears how it was not her fault for cheval had kept her threatening to beat her if she ran away he was becoming mad with jealousy and wished to prevent her from returning to etienne's bed where he well knew he said that the family made her sleep maheude was furious and after forbidding her daughter ever to see such a brute again talked of going to monceau to box his ears but all the same it was a day lost and the girl now that she had this lover preferred not to change him two days after there was another incident on monday and tuesday jeanlin who was supposed to be quietly engaged on his task at the bureau had escaped to run away into the marshes and the forest of vandame with bebert and lydie he had seduced them no one knew to what plunder or to what games of precocious children they had all three given themselves up he received a vigorous punishment a whipping which his mother applied to him on the pavement outside before the terrified children of the settlement who could have thought such a thing of children belonging to her who had cost so much since their birth and who ought now to be bringing something in and in this cry there was the remembrance of her own hard youth of the hereditary misery which made of each little one in the brood a breadwinner later on that morning when the men and the girl set out for the pit maheude sat up in her bed to say to jeanlin you know that if you begin that game again you little beast i'll take the skin off your bottom in maheude's new stall the work was hard this part of the filonniere seam was so thin that the pikemen squeezed between the wall and the roof grazed their elbows at their work it was too becoming very damp from hour to hour they feared a rush of water one of those sudden torrents which burst through rocks and carry away men the day before as etienne was violently driving in his pick and drawing it out he had received a jet of water in his face but this was only an alarm the cutting simply became damper and more unwholesome besides he now thought nothing of possible accidents he forgot himself there with his mates careless of peril they lived in fire damp without even feeling its weight on their eyelids the spider's web veil which it left on the eyelashes sometimes when the flame of the lamps grew paler and bluer than usual it attracted attention and a miner would put his head against the seam to listen to the low noise of the gas a noise of air bubbles escaping from each crack but the constant threat was of landslips for besides the insufficiency of the timbering always patched up too quickly the soil soaked with water would not hold three times during the day maheu had been obliged to add to the planking it was half past two and the men would soon have to ascend lying on his side etienne was finishing the cutting of a block when a distant growl of thunder shook the whole mine what's that then he cried putting down his axe to listen he had at first thought that the gallery was falling in behind his back but maheu had already glided along the slope of the cutting saying it's a fall quick quick all tumbled down and hastened carried away by an impulse of anxious fraternity their lamps danced at their wrists in the deathly silence which had fallen 
they rushed in single file along the passages with bent backs as though they were galloping on all fours and without slowing this gallop they asked each other questions and threw brief replies where was it then in the cuttings perhaps no it came from below no from the haulage when they arrived at the chimney passage they threw themselves into it tumbling one over the other without troubling about bruises jeanlin with skin still red from the whipping of the day before had not run away from the pit on this day he was trotting with naked feet behind his tram closing the ventilation doors one by one when he was not afraid of meeting a captain he jumped on to the last tram which he was not allowed to do for fear he should go to sleep but his great amusement was whenever the tram was shunted to let another one pass to go and join bebert who was holding the reins in front he would come up slyly without his lamp and vigorously pinch his companion inventing mischievous monkey tricks with his yellow hair his large ears his lean muzzle lit up by little green eyes shining in the darkness with morbid precocity he seemed to have the obscure intelligence and the quick skill of a human abortion which had returned to its animal ways in the afternoon Malk brought Bataille, whose turn it was to the trammers and as the horse was snuffing in the shunting john lynn who had glided up to bebert asked him what's the matter with the old hack to stop short like that he'll break my legs bebert could not reply he had to hold in bataille who was growing lively at the approach of the other tram the horse had smelled from afar his comrade trompette for whom he had felt great tenderness ever since the day when he had seen him disembarked in the pit one might say that it was the affectionate pity of an old philosopher anxious to console a young friend by imparting to him his own resignation and patience for trompette did not become reconciled drawing his trams without any taste for the work standing with lowered head blinded by the darkness and forever regretting the sun so every time that bataille met him he put out his head snorting and moistened him with an encouraging caress by god swore bebert there they are licking each other's skins again then when trompette had passed he replied on the subject of bataille oh he's a cunning old beast when he stops like that it's because he guesses there's something in the way a stone or a hole and he takes care of himself he doesn't want to break his bones to-day i don't know what was the matter with him down there after the door he pushed it and stood stock still did you see anything no said jeanlin there's water i've got it up to my knees the tram set out again and on the following journey when he had opened the ventilation door with a blow from his head the tail again refused to advance neighing and trembling at last he made up his mind and set off with a bound jeanlin who closed the door had remained behind he bent down and looked at the mud through which through which he was paddling then raising his lamp he saw that the wood had given way beneath the continual bleeding of a spring just then a pikeman one berlot who was called chicot had arrived from his cutting in a hurry to go to his wife who had just been confined he also stopped and examined the planking and suddenly as the boy was starting to rejoin his train a tremendous cracking sound was heard and a landslip engulfed the man and the child there was deep silence a thick dust raised by the wind of the fall passed through the passages blinded and choked the miners came from every part even from the farthest stalls with their dancing lamps which feebly lighted up this gallop of black men at the bottom of these mole hills when the first men tumbled against the landslip they shouted out and called their mates a second band come from the cutting below found themselves on the other side of the mass of earth which stopped up the gallery it was at once seen that the roof had fallen in for a dozen metres at most the damage was not serious but all hearts were contracted when a death rattle was heard from the ruins bebert leaving his tram ran up repeating jeanlin is underneath jeanlin is underneath maheu at this very moment had come out of the passage with zacharie and etienne 
he was seized with the fury of despair and could only utter oaths my god my god my god catherine lydie and moquette who had also rushed up began to sob and shriek with terror in the midst of the fearful disorder which was increased by the darkness the men tried to make them be silent but they shrieked louder as each groan was heard the captain richomme had come up running in despair that neither négrel the engineer nor danseur was at the pit with his ear pressed against the rocks he listened and at last said those sounds could not come from a child a man must certainly be there maheu had already called jeanlin twenty times over not a breath was heard the little one must have been smashed up and still the groans continued monotonously they spoke to the agonized man asking him his name the groaning alone replied look sharp repeated richomme who had already organized a rescue we can talk afterwards from each end the miners attacked the landslip with pick and shovel chaval worked without a word beside maheu and etienne while zacharie superintended the removal of the earth the hour for ascent had come and no one had touched food but they could not go up for their soup while their mates were in peril they realized however that the settlement would be disturbed if no one came back and it was proposed to send off the women but neither catherine nor moquette nor even lydie would move nailed to the spot with a desire to know what had happened and to help levaque then accepted the commission of announcing the landslip up above a simple accident which was being repaired it was nearly four o'clock in less than an hour the men had done a day's work half the earth would have already been removed if more rocks had not slid from the roof maheu persisted with such energy that he refused with a furious gesture when another man approached to relieve him for a moment gently said richomme at last we are getting near we must not finish them off in fact the groaning was becoming more and more distinct it was a continuous rattling which guided the workers and now it seemed to be beneath their very picks suddenly it stopped in silence they all looked at one another and shuddered as they felt the coldness of death pass in the darkness they dug on soaked in sweat their muscles tense to breaking they came upon a foot and then began to remove the earth with their hands freeing the limbs one by one the head was not hurt they turned their lamps on it and chicot's neck went round he was quite warm with his spinal column broken by a rock wrap him up in a covering and put him in a tram ordered the captain now for the lad look sharp maheu gave a last blow and an opening was made communicating with the men who were clearing away the soil from the other side they shouted out that they had just found jeanlin unconscious with both legs broken still breathing it was the father who took up the little one in his arms with clenched jaws constantly uttering my god to express his grief while catherine and the other women again began to shriek a procession was quickly formed bébert had brought back bataille who was harnessed to the trams in the first lay chicot's corpse supported by etienne in the second maheu was seated with jeanlin still unconscious on his knees covered by a strip of wool torn from a ventilation door they started at a walking pace on each tram was a lamp like a red star then behind followed the row of miners some fifty shadows in single file now that they were overcome by fatigue they trailed their feet slipping in the mud with the mournful melancholy of a flock stricken by an epidemic it took them nearly half an hour to reach the pit eye this procession beneath the earth in the midst of deep darkness seemed never to end through galleries which bifurcated and turned and unrolled at the pit high richomme who had gone on before had ordered an empty cage to be reserved perron immediately loaded the two trams in the first maheu remained with his wounded little one on his knees while in the other etienne kept chicot's corpse between his arms to hold it up when the men had piled themselves up in the other decks the cage rose it took two minutes the rain from the tubbing fell very cold 
and the men looked up towards the air impatient to see daylight fortunately a trammer sent to dr van der hagen's had found him and brought him back schoenlin and the dead man were placed in the captain's room where from year's end to year's end a large fire burnt a row of buckets with warm water was ready for washing feet and two mattresses having been spread on the floor the man and the child were placed on them maheu and etienne alone entered outside putters miners and boys were running about forming groups and talking in a low voice as soon as the doctor had glanced at chicot done for you can wash him two overseers undressed him and then washed with a sponge this corpse blackened with coal and still dirty with the sweat of work nothing wrong with the head said the doctor again kneeling on jeanlin's mattress near the chest either ah it's the legs which have given he himself undressed the child unfastening the cap taking off the jacket drawing off the breeches and shirt with the skill of a nurse and the poor little body appeared as lean as an insect stained with black dust and yellow earth marbled by bloody patches nothing could be made out and they had to wash him also he seemed to grow leaner beneath the sponge the flesh so pallid and transparent that one could see the bones it was a pity to look on this last degeneration of a wretched race this mere nothing that was suffering and half crushed by the falling of the rocks when he was clean they perceived the bruises on the thighs two red patches on the white skin jeanlin awaking from his faint moaned standing up at the foot of the mattress with hands hanging down maheu was looking at him and large tears rolled from his eyes eh are you the father said the doctor raising his head no need to cry then you can see he's not dead help me instead he found two simple fractures but the right leg gave him some anxiety it would probably have to be cut off at this moment the engineer negrel and danseur who had been informed came up with Rochon. the first listened to the captain's narrative with an exasperated air he broke out always this cursed timbering had he not repeated a hundred times that they would leave their men down there and those brutes who talked about going out on strike if they were forced to timber more solidly the worst was that now the company would have to pay for the broken pots m hondo would be pleased who is it he asked of dansart who was standing in silence before the corpse which was being wrapped up in a sheet chicot one of our good workers replied the chief captain he has three children poor chap dr van der hagen ordered jeanlin's immediate removal to his parents six o'clock struck twilight was already coming on and they would do well to remove the corpse also the engineer gave orders to harness the van and to bring a stretcher the wounded child was placed on the stretcher while the mattress and the dead body were put into the van some putters were still standing at the door talking with some miners who were waiting about to look on when the door reopened there was silence in the group a new procession was then formed the van in front then the stretcher and then the train of people they left the mine square and went slowly up the road to the settlement the first november cold had denuded the immense plain the night was now slowly bearing it like a shroud fallen from the livid sky etienne then in a low voice advised maheude to send catherine on to warn maheude so as to soften the blow the overwhelmed father who was following the stretcher agreed with a nod and the young girl set out running for they were now near but the van that gloomy well-known box was already signalled women ran out wildly on to the paths three or four rushed about in anguish without their bonnets soon there were thirty of them then fifty all choking with the same terror then someone was dead who was it the story told by levaque after first reassuring them now exaggerated their nightmare it was not one man it was ten who had perished and who were now being brought back in the van one by one catherine found her mother agitated by a presentiment and after hearing the first stammered words maheude cried the father's dead the young girl 
protested in vain speaking of jeanlin without hearing her maheude had rushed forward and on seeing the van which was passing before the church she grew faint and pale the women at their doors mute with terror were stretching out their necks while others followed trembling as they wondered before whose house the procession would stop the vehicle passed and behind it maheude saw maheude who was accompanying the stretcher then when they had placed the stretcher at her door and when she saw jeanlin alive with his legs broken there was so sudden a reaction in her that she choked with anger stammering without tears is this it they cripple our little ones now both legs my god what do they want me to do with him be still then said dr vanderhagen who had followed to attend to jeanlin would you rather he had remained below but maheude grew more furious while alzire lenore and henri were crying round her as she helped to carry up the wounded boy and to give the doctor what he needed she cursed fate and asked where she was to find money to feed invalids the old man was not thin enough now this rascal too had lost his legs and she never ceased while other cries more heart-breaking lamentations were heard from a neighbouring house chicot's wife and children were weeping over the body it was now quite night the exhausted miners were at last eating their soup and the settlement had fallen into a melancholy silence only disturbed by these loud outcries three weeks passed it was found possible to avoid amputation jeanlin kept both his legs but he remained lame on investigation the company had resigned itself to giving a donation of fifty francs it had also promised to find employment for the little cripple at the surface as soon as he was well all the same their misery was aggravated for the father had received such a shock that he was seriously ill with fever since thursday maheu had been back at the pit and it was now sunday in the evening etienne talked of the approaching date of the first of december preoccupied in wondering if the company would execute its threat they sat up till ten o'clock waiting for catherine who must have been delaying with cheval but she did not return maheude furiously bolted the door without a word etienne was long in going to sleep restless at the thought of that empty bed in which alzire occupied so little room next morning she was still absent and it was only in the afternoon on returning from the pit that the maheus learnt that chaval was keeping catherine he created such abominable scenes with her that she had decided to stay with him to avoid reproaches he had suddenly left the Verrou and had taken on at jean bart m de nolin's mine and she had followed him as a putter the new household still lived at monceau at piquet's maheu at first talked of going to fight the man and of bringing his daughter back with a kick in the backside then he made a gesture of resignation what was the good it always turned out like that one could not prevent a girl from sticking to a man when she wanted to it was much better to wait quietly for the marriage but maheu did not take things so easily did i beat her when she took this cheval she cried to etienne who listened in silence very pale see now tell me you who are a sensible man we have left her free haven't we because my god they all come to it now i was in the family way when the father married me but i didn't run away from my parents and i should never have done so dirty a trick as to carry the money i earned to a man who had no want of it before the proper age ah oh, it's disgusting you know people will leave off getting children and as etienne still replied only by nodding his head she insisted a girl who went out every evening where she wanted to what has she got in her skin then not to be able to wait till i married her after she had helped to get us out of difficulties eh it's natural one has a daughter to work but there we have been too good we ought not to let her go and amuse herself with a man give them an inch and they take an ell alzire nodded approvingly and lenore and henri overcome by this storm cried quietly while the mother now enumerated their misfortunes first zacharie 
who had had to get married then old bonnemort who was there on his chair with his twisted feet then jean lin who could not leave the room for ten days with his badly united bones and now as a last blow this jade catherine who had gone away with a man the whole family was breaking up there was only the father left at the pit how were they to live seven persons without counting estelle on his three francs they might as well jump into the canal in a band it won't do any good to worry yourself said maheu in a low voice perhaps we have not got to the end etienne who was looking fixedly at the flags on the floor raised his head and murmured with eyes lost in a vision of the future ah it is time it is time End of section 16